Now we're ready to go. Well, good morning to each of you. So we're continuing our study in the book of Revelation, and we are wrapping up chapter 13 today. If you remember last time, we looked at the sea beast that rose up out of the sea, and we made a comparison between him and the beast in Romans chapter 7, the fourth beast, and saw that he was the Roman Empire. And now we're going to continue to look at not just the sea beast, but he has some help. And so that's going to be where we pick up today is with the earth beast in the remainder of chapter 13. All right, what was the origin of the second beast and how might this help us understand what the beast represents? All right, first part's the easy part. He rose up from the earth. Rose up from the earth. All right, very good. And hence the name earth beast. So how does this help us understand who he is? What does he represent? All right. All right. So it's something of this world. All right. Very good. Anything else we can nail it down to? All right, so we know it's something different than uh, the sea beast, obviously, because it's not arising from the same place. And this is the sea beast, we understand, is something that has to do with government or politics, a national empire, a kingdom that's rising up, like we saw in Daniel 7 with the four beasts that arise from there. So this is not something of that nature. It's something a little bit different. All right, so let's look at uh, the verse here. So. 1311, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. So there's a few possibilities that are more commonly represented. So in the commentaries, you'll find that people often think of this as being like the realm of the unregenerate. So this would be the realm of those that are lost, uh, in contrast to those who are saved and sealed. And that'll be more evident why that is. But maybe a more specific version of this is to think of this as the realm of false religion. Those who are, are not just lost, but those that are associated with false religion and religious institutions. And if you think of even atheism is a religion in and of itself, right? Unbelief is still a religion. I believe in myself to take care of myself. I become a god to myself. So even those who don't ascribe to a specific religion, uh, as we think about it, are actually ascribing to a religion. So this would be in contrast to the sea or, or to true religion as being the alternative. So just for reference, those that believe that this book is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, see this referring to like Palestine itself, to Jerusalem or to Judea versus the Gentiles. All right, so I think part of the reason that we can ascribe it to false religion is because without any explanation, this is the last time it's called the earth beast. From this point going forward, just without any kind of explanation, it's called the false prophet from now on. So, so we understand that it has something to do with religion, and it's obviously not something that is political, so that, that takes out one of our other options as well. So it, it seems like kind of just whittling it down to our remaining options. Number two seems like the best option. And you'll find that this fits pretty well as we go through with the narrative. So I think what we have here, if you think of the sea beast being national, political, government institutions, right? And if the earth beast represents false religion, religious institutions, if you will, then these are the two institutions that God created to serve him and to serve mankind. And you'll find this theme as we go throughout the scriptures. When Romans 13, 1 to 4 talks about government being God's minister to avenge justice and to protect the people as well. But as you're looking at Genesis 14, I have 18, and then Lamentations 2, 6, and then Zechariah 6, 10 to 15, and then Hebrews 7, all of these reference either Melchizedek, being uniquely both priest and king, or they reference uh, Jerusalem, Judah being the home of both priest and king. These are these two institutions that God created. And Zechariah 6 is interesting because uh, there is a, a, a 
double crown, or it calls it an ornate crown, but it's actually a double crown. So it's like two crowns in one that's created to represent the Messiah. Again, he is the both priest and the king. And this is something that's set aside uh, for Jeshua and for the high priest. And it talks about the priest ruling on his throne in Zechariah 6. So this seems to be the representation of these two separate institutions. However, they're not serving God. They're not serving mankind. They've become beasts. They are, they are serving themselves. They are taking advantage of God's institutions and using it for their own agenda. All right, so what is the description of this second beast? How is he shown to us? And how does this tell us who he is and how he behaves? He has uh, two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. All right, very good. So, being a lamb, what would that suggest? Innocence and uh, friendliness. All right, and who's the other lamb that we've seen so far in this book? Jesus. Jesus. So this is somebody who is rivaling Jesus. He is presenting himself as an alternative to Jesus. Now, that's how he presents himself, but how does he talk? He talks like a dragon. So what's coming out of his mouth is something entirely different. So he says, I saw another beast, had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. So he has a very deceitful appearance. He's trying to subvert himself, subvert the true lamb, and stand in his place. And this, again, is something we see consistently through Scripture. So 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15, Paul says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. All right, does that mean they actually change their physical appearance? No. Again, it has to do with what's coming out of their mouth. Their words, how they speak, and how they initially behave, they present themselves as one thing. But in reality, they are something else. As Jesus said, they're uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. So, just like the devil, like the dragon, who only speaks lies, this lamb is also a liar. So Jesus said in John 8, 44, speaking to the Jews in this case, he says, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do, for he was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So, as I mentioned earlier, Matthew 7, 15 through 20, Jesus told us that false teachers will appear as lambs or sheep in wolves' clothing, but we will know them by their works, by how they behave, by what they say. This is going to reveal their true nature, just like it's doing in this case, too. This is really a product of the dragon because it's using his words. All right. Uh, so the two horns, remember, two is the idea in the mouth of two or three written witnesses, right? So two is the idea of uh, doubling up, reassurance, verification. And so that would cause us to think that this, this beast is either going to be confirmed or reassured in some way, or he's going to be fulfilling the role of confirming or reassuring in some way as well. All right, so with that in mind, what kinds of things does the second beast do? What seems to be its primary purpose or role? More specifically than what I just said. He causes the earth to worship the first beast. All right, he causes the earth to worship the first beast, and how does he do that? With his authority? What else? He deceives, he deceives them through what? Forms great signs. Through great signs. All right, very good. So I think we've nailed it down there. So verses 12 to 18, or 14 here of chapter 13, he, exer he exercises all authority of the first beast. All right, so the first beast, just like the dragon, gave the sea beast his authority and his throne and his power. That beast, in turn, gives authority and power to the second beast. So he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth, and again, notice he's causing the earth, and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. 
whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. All right, we're going to talk more about the wounding and the healing as we go, but for now, let's just pass over it and just understand that that's somehow associated with this first beast, that somehow he was wounded and then healed in some way. All right. So he operates under the first beast authority. So if the first beast is the Roman government, he's somehow operating under the Roman government's authority. Now, this would remind us, remember Moses going before Pharaoh, working signs, and at first, Pharaoh's magicians were able to keep up with Moses and work some of the same miracles that he worked, at least the appearance, even if they weren't on the same scale. But eventually, they couldn't keep up, and they said, this is the finger of God. There, there, we cannot do this. So it reminds us of that kind of thing, that they're working these deceptive signs, these fake signs. Again, think back to 2 Corinthians 11. All right, Jesus warns in Matthew 24, 24, this is before the destruction of Jerusalem, but would apply here as well, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So, uh, again, think about Simon the Sorcerer from Acts chapter 8. How did he convince people? He had some kind of magic trick, some kind of something that he was able to do to convince people. But once Stephen was there working real miracles, he was like, well, I can't do that. That's, and so even, even Simon the Sorcerer was converted in that case. So this is that same kind of difference we're seeing here as well. All right, we're also warned in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 10, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. Um, another very powerful passage that warns about the importance of loving truth, obviously, and being sincere, being a person of integrity, but notice how this person is going to be affected through the working of Satan, through these lying signs and these, uh, these lying wonders. So, uh, just also mention 2 Thessalonians 2 is very unique in that it also foretells that there would be a great falling away sometime shortly after the apostles and after that era as well. So that becomes a very interesting thing uh, that is especially interesting when you compare it to history, but that one's brief, not really on topic. So notice, how does this function? He's pointing back to the beast. He's pointing back, he was ultimately pointing back to the dragon. What was the role of the two witnesses from chapter 11? They were pointing to the lamb. They were pointing to God. They were speaking. They had testimony. They had message. So we have something, we have a contrast that's being formed before us. We have these two opposing sides that are starting to develop. So he's going to use these signs to direct worship to the image and, or to the first beast and to its image. And even though it's not a specific reference, it does kind of remind us of Daniel 3 and Nebuchadnezzar setting up the image and calling everybody to fall before that and worship. Just, just an example of that kind of behavior, even though it refers to a time back. So, <coughs> specifically, what does this refer to? This is something that would be hard to know if you didn't know a little bit of history and were in debt to the commentators who, who've dug this up. But during this time period, some of the Roman emperors actually enforced worship of themselves. They said that they were gods and they had temples that were built and idols that were set up to them as gods. Not to Zeus, not to Hermes, to whatever, to Nero, to Domitian. They were living gods before men and they wanted the people to worship them. And it, people in certain periods of time in certain places were required to come in maybe offer some incense, bow and scrape for a minute and go on, but they were supposed to acknowledge this Roman emperor as divine, all right? And this fits extremely well. This history fits extremely well with what we're seeing here. And if people didn't do that, they would, of course, be persecuted. Now, I'll just mention, for most people, that would not be that big of a deal. Think about your average Roman being asked to worship one more god. What was the big deal? You got Zeus, you got Hermes, Athena, 
you go on and on and on. They believe in the pantheon, right? So one more God in that cabinet, no big deal. But for the Christian, there is only one God. And so think about Mordecai being asked to, to bow down or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being asked to bow down. They can't bow down to one more God. And so there would be this huge misunderstanding, this huge discrepancy. These emperors would think, okay, this is just something we can do as a political move just to help foster patriotism and help build up the empire. We're not really asking that much. But for the Christian who has this very unique view that these emperors do not remotely understand, when they say, no, we will not bow down, then they're going to see it as an act of treason. If you're against me, then you're against the entire government. And they're not, they're not going to be able to understand. And so you can kind of see how this would actually result in persecution because they would not bow down. But this is the road that we're called to. So there was a temple erected in Pergamum as early as 29 BC, so you know, almost 30 years before Jesus. Nero and Domitian were the first emperors to actually do this. Nero was the first, not nearly as widespread. Domitian was the one that was going to be actually making it much more widespread and would have actually focused on Asia Minor. That's where one of the earliest temples uh, was set up, and that's where it was worst the earliest. All right. Any questions or concerns about this? Thoughts before we leave this? All right, so what restriction, now that we kind of understand who this beast is and why he's doing what he's doing, what restriction does he impose that will make life difficult for Christians? All right, cannot buy or sell unless you receive the mark of the beast. So verses 15 to 17, uh, he causes people... He causes the image of the beast to speak and as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. All right, so this should make us think back okay we've seen this kind of behavior we've seen this kind of action before remember back in chapter 7 where the angels were holding back the winds until god's people could be marked or sealed on their foreheads so this would be kind of comparable to that but this is kind of going the other way this is marking those who will worship the beast who will ultimately be followers of the devil now how do you think these marks were evident how would we see these marks how do you see the mark of a Christian? Has he got like a mark on his forehead? Or like a raven eye. That's right. So, notice these are on their right hands, so their place of prominent skill and power and working, right? So, the way that I behave most dominantly, my right hand as opposed to my left, and then the way that I'm thinking, my forehead, so the way that I talk, the way that I think, the way that I act, the way I go to, should manifest the fact, should give evidence to the fact that I'm a Christian. So think about the fruit of the Spirit, right? Those are things that we see in the behavior of God's people, Galatians 5, 16 through 26. This would be the contrast. These people would also be evident by the way that they talked, by the way that they acted. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like a physical thing, like a little token or a card or something. It may have been. It may have been that they actually had a physical mark, but it doesn't have to be. It could be something, again, thinking this is a figurative book, uh, it actually lends itself towards thinking this would be a spiritual, observable difference, but it could include the other as well. All right, so any that would not worship the beast, they would suffer at least economic persecution. They would suffer hardship, not being able to buy or sell, but some of these would actually suffer death. So this, again, take us back to chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, being faithful unto death, and where my faithful witness, my faithful martyr was killed, Antipas. So this would be something that would be already starting to occur, and it would continue to get worse during this time period. All right, any other thoughts or questions, comments? 
Go ahead, Joshua. So one of the bad questions that I'll just get the history of the church. Mm -hmm. But so from this time period, how are they looking at it? Have the church even kind of started yet? Have it? No, it w already would have. So think back to chapter two and three, where Jesus is saying that Antipas, my faithful martyr, was killed. Right. So there was already, and he talks about those dwelling in the seat of Satan. So this was something that was already starting to heat up, but it was going to get worse. So they're receiving explanation, understanding into what's going on, which might have been very surprising to them. Like, how could this possibly be happening? So just like we're seeing all of this backstory and kind of the curtains being pulled back and we see where this is all coming from, this is really a war against the devil. And uh, this empire is actually representing him. They would also be receiving that understanding as well. And then they would be receiving the, both the warning and the comforts associated with knowing that God is ultimately going to judge and overcome. Good question. Anything else? All right. So what is the number associated and with which beast is it associated? What are we supposed to learn from this? All right, very good. So, 666, or 666, number of the first beast, the sea beast, because that's what we have from the context, is the second beast is pointing back to the first. So the subject is actually the first beast. That's everything being directed back towards him. Now, what can we learn from this? Very good. All right. So he says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. All right. So chapter 13, 18. So a lot of people have said and have tried, and there's been a ton of different efforts to say, he says, uh, let him calculate. And so this is actually the word for count, like so to, to count up. And so a lot of people have tried to take the letters in different people's names and then substitute them with numbers and sum them all together, all right? So like letter A would be one, letter B would be two, and so on and so forth. So just trying to make a code out of it. And so if you work at it, you can get just about anything you can imagine out of it. So the, the most interesting one is you can almost get Nero Caesar, except for you have to add the letter N and you have to take it into Hebrew and then into Greek and then into Latin. So, yeah, there's a few hoops to jump through there. So, uh, but you can also get Hitler. You can get several of the popes by name. Uh, you can get them, Napoleon, several other people you can get. So what's the point? The point is, is that's not the way to go. You're going down the wrong path. That's a, that's a dead end. Again, this is a very symbolic book. And six has very specific significance to us so six this is this represents man it is the day that man was created and it's falling short of seven all right it's falling short of the glory of god romans 3 23 so it's falling short of god's perfection as well and then we're told as andrew brought up this is the number of a man all right so again emphasizing that so remember three, we often think of three as having something to do with the Trinity, but I don't think it's that. It's really the idea of emphasis. So you see words repeated three times in four verses in the scripture. Twice, it's God being holy, holy, holy. But another time we've already seen in Revelation, it's woe, woe, woe. So tremendous doom. But in Jeremiah twenty-two twenty-nine, 29, we have earth, earth, earth a proclamation given to the, to the earth to see. So, uh, which is particularly interesting if you look at the verse that follows that in context of what we're talking about. But, so if three is extreme emphasis and six is man, then what is he saying? He's saying man, man, man. Or we might say failure, 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 doom, doom, doom. This is not going to succeed. This is not God. As Andrew said, this person is setting themselves up as God but they are just man, and that's being emphasized over and over and over again. 
So this would be our fifth occurrence, if you will, even though it's not in a word. This would be our fifth occurrence of the same thing showing up three times in a row here. So just extreme emphasis that this, what is being presented to them is just man. So this represents the colossal spectacular failure of the persecuting Roman emperor in his kingdom. Remember, we've often seen the empire being personified, the power being consolidated symbolically in its king, in its emperor. When we talk about the emperor, we're talking about the empire. So the failure of this man who's at the head of this is representing the failure of the entire empire. And I don't think this is any specific person. It's any person, any man, who says that he is more than a man and tries to oppose God. He will always be just a man. It will be just failure. And again, this puts the image of Daniel 2 in more, in more uh, light as well. What is the final image that we see there? of all of these empires stacked together. It's, it's an exalted man, but it's still just a man, right? So whether we're thinking of that vision or whether we're thinking about this, no matter how we multiply, organize, scale, optimize, whatever, whatever we do with man, that's all we're going to ever have is just man. It'll never be God. We can never measure up in any kind of way by ourselves to God without God. So it's ultimately going to be failure uh, no matter what we do in these cases. So again, that's warning, right? If you try to go it alone, how's it going to work out? Failure. But it's comfort as well. The enemy that is oppressing you, at the end of the day, he's mortal. He is just a man. He's not going to succeed and he's not going to be there forever either. So it's warning and comfort at the same time. All right, any other thoughts on this before we leave it? Is there a reason you think it says calculate the number and then give the number? I don't know. It's just easier to say. Uh, yeah. So what are you thinking? I'm not sure. I was just. It, it doesn't. It's just. It was just interesting to me. It doesn't say here's the number. It says calculate the number and here's the number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I looked it up, and the, the word for calculate there is, is just the word for count. Like with the passage we've looked at before, whoever um, begins a war from, what is it going to be, Luke 16 or 18, doesn't first count the cost. I mean, the idea is, is like you're, you're actually counting up how much it is and seeing what it, you know, what it adds up to, right? And so there's, you can see some credence for trying to make something more out of it. And in this case, we are, right? We're looking, we're calculating it, but we're using a different kind of calculus than just summing it up. We're looking at this is six, six, six. So uh, that would be the way that I would understand it, is that you are supposed to look at this number, break it down, and get a lesson from this. There's something embedded in it. It's just not Nero Caesar, or <laughs> Neron Caesar. All right, good question. So this takes us into the next chapter, and we have uh, chapter 14, dealing with the lamb and his army. So we're going to start with seeing the lamb on Zion. All right, so I've already, go ahead, Joshua. Again, did you miss the name that was here? So we talked a little bit about it last class, and we'll talk about it more in a later class where we get into some more detail about the beast and, the, and its, its heads. But the idea is, first of all, it's very hard to say exactly what it is, but the general idea is in some way, somehow, this beast uh, looks like it's lost. So it seems like something has happened to it, whether it's the empire, and I would say specifically, whether it's the empire or it's the, uh, a specific emperor or emperors, or just the fact that the persecution stops for a little bit. And anyway, somehow, in some way, it looks like it's over with. It looks like it's done with. It looks like it lost. And then it comes back. So um, there's a lot of different things in history you could apply it to where it looked like there would be either political loss, but like that's the end of the empire, and then all of a sudden it's back. So that, that would be what I would lean to the most. But um, anyway, so we're going to see it again with a little bit more detail about the specific horns and stuff. So I'm kind of saving off some of the detailed discussion until then. But it's a good question.
Anything else? All right. Where does the lamb stand? I think I've already given this away. So what's the significance of this? So he stands on Zion. What's the significance of him being on Mount Zion? All right. So it's where everybody's going to come for judgment. What else? All right. So um, let's look at this. So 14.1, then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. So we'll come back to that. So I want you to think about this. We just talked about in chapter 13, the dragon gives authority to the beast. They worship the beast. Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This is a challenge. This is a gauntlet that's thrown down. This is something those Christians would have been living and feeling every day, and it would have been something that they would have, in their doubts and their fears, would have also thought and felt. Who is going to be able to fight against him? Who is able to stand against him? Here's your answer. Here is the, the response to that. Who's able to fight against him? The lamb. And he's on Mount Zion, and he's got his 144,000 with him. So let's talk about Zion for a second. So originally, physically, it was a Jebusite stronghold. And it was captured by David, and then he rebuilt it and made it became the city of David. Uh, you can read about that history in 2 Samuel 5 and 1 Chronicles 11. But later... Solomon would actually build the temple on Mount Zion. And so it came to mean God's dwelling place. Zion is where God dwells. It, it was the highest and it was the best part of Jerusalem. It was the heart of Jerusalem, if you will. So several references here in Psalm 9 as well as Isaiah 8 uh, talking about Mount Zion and being the place where God dwells and where he would send out judgment and where he would send out redemption. So as you continue to go through, uh, it is used in Isaiah 3, again, thinking about representation of God's people. Both physical and national Israel was also represented by this, even if they were wicked. So the daughters, notice plural, the daughters, the women of Zion are haughty. And he goes on to explain about how they dress and how uh, they try to seduce people. So, but notice, it's representing physical Israel, national Israel as a whole, not just the city. So it becomes a personification. And then, again, think back to Romans 9 again. Not all Israel are of Israel. We have a physical, a national Israel, and there's a remnant, there's a core, there's spiritual Israel and that it came to represent. So, again, going back to our discussion about being the daughter of something, of a nation, the daughter of Zion then, it comes to represent uh, the place, the dwelling place, not just of God, but the representation of God's people as well. So remember, uh, the law would go out of Zion. So Isaiah 2, Micah 4, 2, it comes to represent the Messianic kingdom as well. So uh, several prophetic passages referring to that that I'll save for last time. And then Hebrews 12 and Galatians 4 eventually talk about Zion that is above. So becoming a representation of God's people ultimately encapsulated in heaven itself. So the messianic <coughs> kingdom, but even the, the heavenly kingdom eventually. Maybe you could understand these last two as belonging to the messianic kingdom. Um, that, that would be a fair point worth considering. So when he says that he's standing on Mount Zion, this is not any ordinary mountain. This is the place that is the heart of God's dwelling place. This is going to be where his kingdom and his church would come from. And this would be the place where he dwells and where his activity would come out of. So the fact that Jesus is standing there, the lamb is standing there, has a special significance. All right, one other thought. Notice, we've been looking at these characters, right? The sea beast arises, the other beast arises out of the earth. And here we have the contrast of Jesus. And he arises out of Mount Zion. No. He's standing on Mount Zion. He's always been there. He's not arising out of anywhere. That's where he is. So uh, this provides a powerful contrast with his nature, his eternal nature, contrasted with these beasts that they're coming up and they're going down. All right. So we've looked at this passage several times, but 
again, this is a very powerful reference going back to this. Psalm 2, the nations rage, the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, his Messiah. And notice the Lord laughs and he says, yet I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So a very clear reference to Jesus being a king and going back to this. This, this is where God's king is. And this, this symbol, going back to Psalm 2, represents everything we see here. All of these nations trying to destroy God, his people, casting off their bonds. And what's God's response? He laughs and his king is here. And they're not going to succeed. The only chance they have to survive is to submit. And if they don't, then they're going to end up being destroyed because he's going to break them with a rod of iron. So this scene from Revelation 14 is pulling in all this imagery of Psalm 2 and other symbols as well. All right, lots to think about there. Any other questions or thoughts on this before we leave it? All right, so how does his host compare to those who follow the beast in chapter 13? And who do these people represent? All right, and we've seen this before, the 144,000, right? We saw this back in chapter 7. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. So we saw the earth beast who causes everybody to worship the sea beast, and then he required the mark or the name of the beast and put it on the right hand or the forehead. Again, we saw that in chapter 7 where God's angels were doing that for his people. And here, these people, this 144,000, in contrast to the earth beast and the sea beast, they're worshiping God in the land, and they wear God's name on their forehead. So they're parallel to what we saw in chapter 13 and that their followers... And that they're worshiping, but they're standing in contrast because of who they're following and who they're worshiping. They're following the Lamb. They're worshiping God. All right? So, notice their characteristics. Uh, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They're redeemed among men, first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and they're without fault before the throne of God. So, uh, we talked about this in chapter 7, but I'll mention it again. We often see people being numbered for military purposes. The 144,000, this is all of God's people. 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. So it's all of God's people at any time. But notice they're with the lamb and they're set up as an army at war. All right. Um, next time, let's talk about their characteristics. What lessons can we get from these symbols? And we'll continue to notice that we're getting a contrast being drawn for us between these two opposing sides and those lines forming and being identified for us. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate your participation and your preparation. I'll see you next time.